It is July 9th, and uh, we're doing this on July 8th at night because we had success with it the last time. We're bringing a couple of fellas together. We're going to talk some ball. We're going to talk a little Mahomes, uh, a little win total um, season preview with Evan Silva and Brad Spielberger, and Eric Eager is also here. Um, Eric, I understand that you have a pitch for Evan for a television show. Mm -hmm. So why don't you kick it off with that? Well, Evan, uh, congratulations, by the way, on the move. Um, you know, George and I over the past few weeks have been taking a deep look into the content on Quibi. Uh, and we decided that we were going to make a new show called Cribby, which is basically a six minute version of MTV Cribs. What do you think? Um, it's a little bit on the spot, but, uh, you okay. don't, so you're, you're saying you don't want to show us around your new crib. I could, um, I don't, how, how would I is the question. I would have to carry my computer through all yeah. levels of the home. We can, we can do this on the next episode yeah, and it'll give you time to. to, cause six minutes is not, you know, that's the challenge of the whole Quibi thing. You got to condense it into six minutes. Who would know, who would have known that that was more difficult than than everybody thought. The funny know. thing is that's once again an example of a show that is fake that actually would be better than most of the stuff on Quibi. Um, that's just the kind of uh, the kind of constant you're going to get here. Let's start with Patrick Mahomes. And um, the, the uniqueness of the contract, obviously it's 10 years, like potentially 503 million. But Brad, aside from that, like what, what are some of the unique components of this contract and what might be some of the ramifications sure so yeah it's obviously unique we haven't seen these kind of decades long contracts since you know Culpepper far you know over a decade now so to move back to that structure was a bit surprising uh, we hear a lot about getting bites at the apple obviously uh, and so from from a, in terms of how it's going to affect the rest of the league going forward you know, I think this structure, it's actually a structure they utilize with Tyree Kill as well, where you just have these rolling roster bonuses sitting in future years. And then there's trigger dates, usually a year before. This one has a couple there two years before um, that kind of kick in the, the later years. But I think the biggest impact it's going to have, they kind of like to put Easter eggs in these contracts sometimes. The first five new years of the deal has a new money average per year or APY of just under $40 million. So I think if we said, you know, he's going to sign a five-year, $200 million extension, I think all of us would be like, yeah, that, that sounds about right. He still kind of did that in terms of how it's going to impact other players. I, st I think $40 million is still that benchmark, not the forty-five just yet. What One of the things that I was interested about, you know, in looking at it was I expected a shorter one because you go, okay, he's going to be so much more valuable, you know, four years from now wherever the hell we are, he's going to max out once again. Is there, looking at the structure of the contract, it's almost like these two five-year deals. And do you think that there is a natural breaking point where five years from now we're sitting there and we're realizing, wow, Mahomes could get, I don't know, say 50, 60 million, you know, over the next three years, maybe 70 million, whatever it is. And he goes, okay, I'm, I'm going to force the issue. Is that still possible? Yeah, I mean, 100%. And I think that's their critique you get is that, again, I understand it's a half a billion dollar contract and, and 45 a year is a substantial increase over 35. But the reality is that the market explodes, at, especially at quarterback. And like you said, come 2025, you know, 45 a year could look like a bargain. Um, and, and I think that is kind of the year where both the team and Mahomes, it's kind of a trigger year. It's the first year where their dead money would equal that year's cap hit. Ergo, they would still have a $42 million debt cap charge, but it would cancel out a $42 million actual cap charge in the year, you know, in 2025. So it's feasible that either side could maybe look to move on if they, you know, if they wanted to. So one of the things that I, I you know, that I thought about when I thought about this deal was, you know, you look at Patrick Mahomes. He's coming from a family who, you know, where the dad was a professional player. He's going to a franchise which has been good. I mean, for, for decades, have, in the 90s, they were good, never really reached the Super Bowl. The last decade, they were good, never really reached the Super Bowl. 
Evan, do you think from a mutually beneficial perspective, you look at Andy Reid, he said he has no intentions of not co of stopping coaching anytime soon. You look at Mahomes, who doesn't to me seem like the kind of, you know, mercenary Kirk Cousins of the world. He's there. Oh, stop. He's there to like win championships. Do you think that that factors in the fact that, you know, maybe both the team and Mahomes are taking less in some areas just to, you know, to maintain, you know, what could be a dynasty in the modern NFL? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely to some extent or to a great extent, he's betting on himself. He's betting on the organization. He loves the city. He is, you know, he, he wants to stay there. And I, I respect that about him. I think, and, and the people that are criticizing Patrick Mahomes for taking this deal, I think, um, you know, it's not like criticizing Ryan Pace for, you know, signing Jimmy Graham to, you know, a, an exorbitant contract. <laughs> More like, you know, it's, it's almost like you, I mean, first of all, he's going to be making a ton of money, you know, like a, a ton of money. And um, he's sacrificing, I think, some potential long-term long long -term gains in, in, you know, in, in, in exchange for some shorter-term gains and, and just what he wants to do. I mean, what is he, 23, 24 years old? I mean, imagine signing a contract for 10 years and half a billion dollars at age 23 or 24. I mean, he's got to be thrilled. And I think that the people that are trying to pour cold water on that, like, just screw them. You know, I mean, I, I, Patrick Mahomes seems like a really, really good dude. He's obviously a dominant, dominant force on the football field. And um, I'm, I'm just happy for him because, um, you know, he, he is I – mean, he, he's helping to change the game a little bit on and off the field. And, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just pulling for the guy, and I, I, I think he's, a, he's such an asset to the league. Let me play a little devil's advocate here because I, I agree with you that if you are going out there and saying like, Oh, he should have, you know, done a different contract. So he could get more money, you know, like go dig a hole, crawl in it and cover yourself back up. But what about this angle, which is I think an important one. You don't want the team to ever feel too comfortable, right? You want them to always be trying to win now, not just collecting money. Right. And with Patrick Mahomes at quarterback, you could do that even if you're not winning Super Bowls. Like, if there's one negative that I would look at, it would be, does he lose? And I'm not sure the answer is, is actually no, but does he lose any leverage in keeping the team honest and making sure that they're always trying to put the very best team out there instead of just collecting checks? I think that's a great question because, you know, that is kind of the impression you get sometimes when you look at Green Bay. Um, that's kind of the impression you get sometimes when you look at other teams. But when you look at Kansas City, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's a, the Chiefs are that town and they are, they're, a, they're a, a franchise and a fan base. Again, when you look at, they've had decades of 600, 700 football that resulted in zero championships. Like, I don't think anybody – it's not like Cincinnati, George, where they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, thanks for coming, guys. You know, everybody's just happy to be here. You know, I, and, and I think Andy Reid, having been a, one of the NFL's best coaches, sixth all-time in wins for de two decades, and having just won just one Super Bowl, I think he's – you know, there's a competitive nature to him as well that's going to try to push the envelope and, and cement his legacy as one of the best coaches in the history of the league. So – I get what you're coming from. And I do, I do like the idea of like in, in certain situations, you do want to make sure that everybody is a little uncomfortable. I, I just think Mahomes, I don't know. I, I have a really high opinion of him and is you know, sort of like, well, you know, I think he wants to win more than he wants to sort of like, you know, extract as much money as possible out of the league. I, I have a question for Eric. Um, and I know that my backdrop is weird. I, I'm like setting up an office and it's far from being set up and I'm sitting in my kitchen right yeah, now. Yeah, I was going to say, is your office in the kitchen? Because mine is. Like I legitimately yeah, am not lying. Right. I'm in a studio and my office is literally over a stove. So I have no, I can't hate on that. But I want to know where Eric is sitting because he appears to be sitting in the bathtub with the shower curtain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, just, I slept here last night too. That, that's, you know... <laughs> Um, no, I mean, this is, this is my, uh, my dining room. I'm just, you know, no one, my family's in, in Wisconsin currently. So I'm sitting here and I, I usually set up upstairs in my office, but I, you know, I don't go upstairs when it's, you know, when no one else is here. So has, has anyone seen like, what's the weirdest backdrop you've seen during uh, quarantine for anyone? We saw it yesterday, didn't we? 
that person on our on our on our <laughs> yeah you want to describe so somebody had a back in a call we had yesterday somebody had a backdrop of the dude and like what was the other guy's name from yeah, i thought movie? that was i honestly is that uh so big, big lebowski I, big lebowski and they I were was, like drink they were like animated and drinking in the background while he was talking i i honestly don't remember a thing he said yesterday <laughs> i i would say that was one of the best <laughs> that i have seen so i'm he the the only guy you notice is the dude I didn't notice that he was even in the frame. The first right, thing right. I noticed was the dude drinking and like nodding. And, and I, I thought it was great. I, I don't know. Have you guys seen anything that's been awful? Besides Evans being muted. Besides my drapes over here? Like, yeah, the drapes you know. do have a shower curtain-esque look. What, what, so to, to get my, us my, back. My, my dream backdrop is like to just oh. have – uh, when I when I finally do set up my like little office room um, to have like you know ETR background uh -huh. um, like with black and green you know that's that's my dream backdrop. That I thought sense. your dream background was like was like Warren Sharp setup in his basement <laughs> with like the eight TVs you know like yeah. you just you just it's went from TVs. grinding film for a whole week and then you're like you turned around in your chair and you're like hi I'm Evan Silva I'm ready to talk or or just like a Josh Allen hologram. In the <laughs> right. I, I thought Could it was be balls, be like, like football sailing over your head on like <laughs> Evan, are you secretly behind the news report that surfaced yesterday that um, that Josh Allen should not expect the same kind of contract that Patrick Mahomes got? Was that your burner? Because that surface, that's a real. If you if people are listening to this and somehow haven't seen that, that was a tweet that was circulating. Is that you? No, I. Because of the move, I like I've been not on Twitter as much, and actually, you know, we have a thread with me, George, uh, Eric, uh, Moo, uh, my uh, my arch nemesis Moo, and um, uh, Josh Gettelsmeyer. Gettelsmeyer and Kev Cole, and, and Kevin Cole, and that was the first. And someone dropped that. Oh, it was Moo who dropped it. Of course, Moo dropped it <laughs> in the uh, in in the the thread, and that was the first that I heard. I I thought the Moo was joking. But um, that's hilarious that, uh, that yeah, we, the Bills are not going to have to pay this, this contract to uh, Josh Allen. Wow. I mean, it's tremendous. The Bears okay. won't have to pay it to Trubisky either. Well, yeah. Speaking of the Bears, uh, their quarterback, Patrick, I mean, sorry, the Chiefs quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> the, after the contract extension the other day, the current line for the Chiefs in terms of number of Super Bowls won over the next 10 years is one and a half. I believe overs minus 125, unders plus 105. What do you guys think of that? Can you hmm. say it one more time? So the Chiefs, the number of Chiefs, the number of Super Bowls won by the Chiefs over the next 10 years, the line, I believe it was, was it uh, M at MGM? One and a half? I mean, I think that's a fair line, like historically, but uh, I, I think I, I, I might actually take the over. Um, that, that might be a fishy uh, you know, overtake, but um, I, I think I would go with that. I, I think they can get two within the next 10 years for sure. What do you, what do you think, Brad? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I, it definitely seems like a trap. I, I know it seems like a low number and obviously, you know, Super Bowls are never easy to win, um, but you give me a full decade. I mean, he's already, his worst season finish is an overtime loss in an AFC championship game. That's the worst <laughs> he's done so far. So I, I think he can pull off two in the next decade. What, what I think is interesting about this, and we're going to talk about uh, Mahomes' projection here in a second because I know that's something Evan is excited to talk about. But look at – so the, the, the Patriots, right? Okay, the Patriots have managed to crush this number. What did they do it with? They did it with a quarterback that was willing to stay there for 20 years, was also ridiculously competitive, and a coach that was probably equally so. So – I actually have no problem taking the over if I know that Andy Reid is sticking around. And Eric, our friend, Seren, who's been on this show, uh, who knows more about the Kansas City Chiefs than anyone that doesn't work for the Kansas City Chiefs would know, is really adamant that he's going to stick around for a while. And if he does, there is no, there's no one coming close to that coach-quarterback duo. I mean, it's just like no one is coming close. And we have seen that win in the NFL. So if, you, if I know – that they're going to stick around for 10 years. I would also take the over, but there's a part of me that also could see, look, they make it back. You know, they, maybe they lose a close game. 
maybe one year, you know, there's an injury that derails them a little bit. And then maybe year five or something like that, they win one more. And then Reed says, you know what, that's it for me. And Mahomes, you know, somehow decides to go to like Miami Dolphins or something. Those are the things that I would see as like derailing the 1.5, yeah. not that they stay there for 10 years and only win one. Well, as you taught in high school math and I taught in, in, in high school and college math, the binomial distribution, yes. you can actually <laughs> look at this, right? So the, the probability of winning zero or one Super Bowl basically breaks even if you give the Chiefs every single season, it looks like a 16% chance to win the Super Bowl. So if you think, you know, if you think the Chiefs are basically what? The favorite? Uh, you know, seven to one every year, right? They're basically the favorite every year. Yeah. So I need basically, and I'm looking at this right now because it's minus 125 to the over. I need probably an 18% chance every year for them to win the Super Bowl to be really, to be for that bet to break even. That being said, I mean, we have them at over 20 this year. You look at the, you look at the way that the quarterback situation in the NFL is structured we had a really fun 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. We had a really fun 20 years where, yeah, the Patriots dominated, but there were a lot of good quarterbacks in the league. If you look at the way it goes now, you know, maybe Lamar, maybe Watson, but Mahomes and Wilson are really the only two locks right now to be elite. And the last time that really happened was like late eighties, early nineties, when you're looking at Steve Young, Dan Marino, Troy Aikman, right? Like the, yeah. the last time we had a consolidation of Super Bowl winners and repeats was when there were relatively few elite quarterbacks in the NFL. And we might be trending that direction. So at the, at the same time, though, we could be in the opposite direction where Kyler Murray takes yep. the next step where Baker Mayfield without Freddie Kitchens and the disaster that that was takes the next step. Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields come in and are, and are great. I am curious about this, though, because I've been thinking about this for a little while. And I referenced LeBron's decision the other day uh, because it, they just did a, a documentary on ESPN. And I was thinking about this, Brad, I'm curious, is, are we getting, or is there any point in the horizon where there is such a player empowerment era in the NFL? And I think we're, tr we're seeing the like makings of it maybe surfacing with um, you know, what Jamal Adams is trying to do, what Deshaun Watson is trying to do, like maybe, but does that ever happen? And if like, if that does happen, that might be what worries me. A team, a super team comes together and says, we're just going to take down Mahomes, Andy Reid. It's really hard. I mean, when you have a 15-man roster in the NBA, you know, really 12 guys that matter versus when you're trying to field a 53-man roster and, um, you know, depth is more important, I, I would argue, uh, to a pretty extreme degree. Uh, it's just so hard. I mean, you're watching the Rams. The Rams are basically trying to do it. I mean, we'll see – when you have Goff, Donald, maybe Ramsey coming up, like, you know, Whitworth now, obviously on the way out, but they're paying uh, um, like five or six guys at the top of their position, obviously moving on from Gurley. But it's so hard to field an adequate roster at every spot when you pay more than really more than like five or six guys in that top echelon. So I, they can try, but I don't know how well it would go. Okay, counterpoint. If Patrick Mahomes is the quarterback on the, on the Rams and not Jared Goff, we're going, holy shit, this worked, right? The issue is not the other guys. It's the quarterback. So if you get one quarterback who is not Mahomes, but he's Russell Wilson, and he goes, you know, screw it. I'm bringing in a couple of stud wide receivers. They're going to take a little bit of a pay cut. The best pass rusher is going to take a little bit of a pay cut. Um, I, I don't know. that. I think that would be fun at least. I, I just – I see in the NFL the – what's the average – uh, time span for a player. It's like three and a half years, right, sure, Brad? Yeah. I mean, and the the average earnings of a player is pretty small. To me, I don't know how many how many players you're going to get to be able to take, you know, that deal. And then the other thing is, is the, it's just harder to win in the NFL. I mean, in the NBA, not only do you only have 15 players on a roster, but the NBA is the least uh, random of all the of all the sports, right, in terms of because there's number of scoring opportunities and all that. Football, like, like, you can go all the way to the AFC Championship game, intercept Tom Brady, and then have D Ford leaning over the neutral zone, right? And then, you know, all, the, all bets are off. So I agree with you that that's, like, the one risk. But I don't see that being a persistent problem for Kansas City. Fine. I tried. Um, Evan, you – 
amongst the many things that you care deeply about, Josh Allen being number one, uh, I listened to the podcast that you did with uh, new senior fan, fantasy analyst at PFF, Ian Harditz. It's great, by the way. If you haven't listened to it, I, no joke, it was the first time I listened all the way through to a fantasy podcast and without even thinking about, you know, saying, ah, maybe I'll put this away and like, you know, listen to it another day. It was awesome. And one of the things you talked about is, is Patrick Mahomes and where he is on your fantasy rankings. So you should go check it out if you want to listen to that. But apparently you also have a little bit of a beef with the PFF projection for Patrick Mahomes. So I'm going to give you the floor yeah. and I'm going to let you talk about it. I mean, the projection was 31 touchdown passes. No, it's 33 now. Oh, hey. oh, it moved up? Well, I think it was always 30. You know. Uh-oh. And, and by, the, by, the, by the end of all this, it's going to be – Yeah, right. Well, I mean, look, right Adam, we're, we're, we have a script that reads your words and, like, incorporates yeah. that into projections. The so. old algorithm trick, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it, it, it came out at 31. If you do, um, you know, just, just some real, you know, back-of-the-napkin math on uh, his touchdowns per game to this point, which is uh, almost two and a half. And if he starts 16 games, he's going to throw for almost 40 uh, uh, um, via that projection. If you just use touchdown rate and if, if you just like – so his career touchdown rate is 6.9, which is really, really high, a very, very nice number, but also really, really high. I mean, he did have that year in 2018 where his touchdown rate was 8.6, and we knew it was going to regress. We were actually lower on him uh, at, at Establish the Run – quite lower than consensus. Um, we had Deshaun Watson ahead of him last year. Deshaun Watson Idiots. scoring him. Um, <laughs> now, there were, there were some injury concerns in there. There were also injury concerns on, on uh, Deshaun Watson's behalf. But either way, so let's, let's say we uh, – so we have Patrick Mahomes at a uh, career touchdown rate of 6.9. Um, that is – you know, and let's, let's say we just – we drop that to six flat. And which would only be a small bump up from last year, uh, which I think he was right at 5.6. And then we do 550 pass attempts, which would be a significant reduction from 2018 when he had 580 in a full season. Then he would be at uh, still at 33 touchdowns. So um, in, in, by either of those back of the napkin projections, and I'm, I'm not a data analyst like George and, and, and Eric are, but – um, you know, I, I would feel pretty comfortable having him between those two, between those two ranges in the, the 33 to 40 range and probably settle, settle at like 37 and a half. Um, well, and I think that 30, 31 is, I, I understand that these are median projections. You know, these are, they're, they're going to be conservative. Like if you ever see Mike Clay doing his statistical projections, I mean, they're really conservative, but in the, in their median projections, they're not, you know, high, low, um, you know, upside, you know, ceiling floor projections. Um, so they always get people upset, but um, but they are they are useful. I just think that um, he he should be closer to like 35, 37 than 31. And yeah, I mean, look, and I it is like 30, 32.6 currently. We have him at second in projected yards, first in touchdowns. Um, it, yeah, very. Yeah, I don't. I don't hate that analysis. I, I think the 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 thing that I might think about as far as like let's say there's a prop out there, and actually, I mean, it'd be interesting to look at that on Caesars here if you give me a second. But um, if you're oh, looking okay. at like prop props for him, I, I think they're going to try to justify the Clyde edwards alaire pick in the red zone. <laughs> I think that they're you know last season his touchdown percentage was again a little low. They were, were a little bit noisier in the red zone in 2019 than they were in 2018. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't hate the idea of, of having him between 33 and 40. I mean, we're just a, a year removed from everybody getting ripped on for having him at like 35 as a projection a season ago, right? Just because he had 50 his first year. So, I mean, yeah, I think if you're talking about him in the 20s, that's way too low. I think low 30s is still probably a bit low, but as you said, they're like medium projections where you have to consider sort of, uh, you know, factors that he's like sort of never you, had. You to have to consider before. like, what if he gets hurt? I mean, yeah, you know, or or if Tyreek gets hurt, you know, for half a season, or if Travis Kelsey does, 
Um, so no, I which mean, is which is sort of what we saw last season, right? Like in the, the, the Tyreek, what do you miss? Four, three or four games, yeah. Yeah, and that he Tyreek missed four of the first five games. Uh, I think that that Sunday night football game, he didn't have Sammy Watkins, Tyreek Hill, and he was throwing to Byron Pringle, right? And and against the Colts in that one game. Um, yeah, that'd be my only that'd be my only reservation is like there's in all of these things like it's asymmetric, right? There's only so high a, per, a player can go really, but there is no like I mean there's a ton of things that can go wrong that are hard to recover from. I couldn't find but, but it you on do have Caesars. In your projections, uh, projected to throw the most touchdown passes in the league, even though it seems low at 32.6, right? Right. Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's we, have, we have only one player, if I'm looking at this correctly. Yeah, we only have one player projected over 30 touchdown passes. Last season there were four, but there was only one that went over 33. So it's like – yeah, you know that some players are going to throw for 30 touchdowns, but it's actually relatively random who those players are year to year. Um, like every we, win total being too low. In, right, including Mahomes, right? Like Mahomes wasn't even a 30-touchdown thrower last year, and I know he missed three games, but, you know, that that's kind of the way that the, those things shake out. Well, I thought it was super interesting the way that, Evan, that was the most math that um, I would ever have expected out of you. You have succeeded maybe my expectations there. But when you did, you know, six six percent touchdown rate, five hundred fifty pass attempts, and you landed right on thirty three, like I thought that was that was perfectly indicative of how you end up at a number like thirty two point six, but feel it's too low, because as you're going through this in your head, you're not thinking about the what happens to get him below that number. You're thinking about yeah, but he could be better than this because I've seen him be better than this so many times, and often you know we just our brains are predisposed to remember the brilliance and forget some of the things that were not as brilliant. And I would not be surprised this year. Like I thought the chiefs won the super bowl in large part because Patrick Mahomes kneecap got dislocated. Like his this, ankle was in a bad way. Yeah. I and, see this prop. I see this prop at 36 and a half somewhere. Okay. I, I found it at 35 and a half like posted end of May. So that, that makes sense. So are you taking the under, Eric? <laughs> he is not. No, I've, he never, is I've, not. Never, I've never taken it. I've bet against the Chiefs in a game before, but I've never taken their win total under or anything. Although, Reed's, Reed's what, 6-0 and oh in season win total over. So, um, let's, let's talk about uh, – their, so their prop is 46 99 and a half. 40, 4,700 yards, basically. It's his passing yardage prop which is about right where we have them. We have them at 47, 43. So let's, uh, let's talk about some win totals here, some season long stuff. Um, Eric and I did a little pod on it, uh, summing up some of ours. And I'm curious for you guys, if there are uh, any teams out there that uh, you're particularly high. Now I don't want you to start with the bills, Evan. Um, I hope you have some other teams that you are confident in this year. But uh, win totals that, that you're excited about, under or over? Come back to me. I'm pulling up DraftKings Sportsbook. Okay. Seeing, uh, seeing what the win totals are. But, we'll cut uh, this part. Hey, Don't worry about let's it. Let's hear Brad talk about the Bears. We'll cut this. We'll cut I, this I know that he's you know a, a mainly Bears dude. That's true. Yeah. And, I mean, they're an interesting team. Their schedule is not particularly difficult. They may be in court. I mean, there's risk of in-season quarterback uh, controversy. Especially if they start with Trubisky, which some people think they're starting with Trubisky. They're trying to. That, how else do you rationalize signing Nick Foles over, like, Jameis Winston and Cam Newton? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, happy to dive in, of course. Yes. Um, the, th the thing <laughs> that bothered me. I was going to tie the conversation all together earlier, too, because the, there's a, a funny joke running around right now if – uh, is Trubisky's next contract going to be one one hundredth of Mahomes's? Is he going to sign a four and a half million dollar deal? Um, which I mean is it's it's a decent over under, honestly. Oh, that's that would be tremendous. <laughs> but yeah. So, um, so so Brad, Brad, I let, let me just interject this. Um, so the one thing that really bothered me about the Bears draft was, or their off season really, is that they're kind of just trying to run it back. Like their offensive line was uh, on the offensive line and their, their offensive line in 2018 was fine. You know, last year it was stone bad. 
And it was really the same cast of characters. They did do the switch with white hair and uh, Daniels and Kyle Long just kind of fell off the cliff and, you know, all that. And they were running out, I don't even, Rashad Coward, you know, what a bad name for an offensive line at, at, at right guard. And, you know, what was their, their biggest offseason addition on the offensive line was Jermaine Ifedi, who I think they're going to try to play at right, at right guard in that right guard spot, I think. I don't know. We don't, we don't really even know because there's no – there's no, you know, June minicamp. There's no OTAs. Like, there's nobody lining up and, you know, the offensive line coach, um, you know, trying them out, you know, at, at different spots. And, you know, there's no reporters reporting back on that. So that, that's really the one thing, like, I, I know that we diminish the value of the, of the running game, but when you do have a consistent running game that has some level of, you know, uh, above margin, uh, efficiency that can be very helpful to an offense that isn't getting consistent quarterback play right I mean at least they're able to move the chains to some extent so I don't know that was the big disappointment for me that you know they took with those two second rounders they took Cole Komet who I mean I think he's a fine prospect but he's probably not going to give you a whole lot of impact in year one um, and then they took Jalen Johnson who they I mean, they almost couldn't even pass on him because he was such a value there but Still, I was thinking going in the draft, just use those two second rounders, take offensive linemen with both. I, I thought that that was like double down. I thought that was the best, um, their best approach. But I don't know. Let's let's hear you, you talk a little bit about the Bears. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, if you told me that the biggest deal they would have signed in this offseason was a 31-year-old edge rusher, I, I would have been very confused as to why that was the focal point of their offseason, um, you know, in the non foals category. Uh, I mean, you mentioned Jalen Johnson, who I'm high on as well, but I figured you you attack the offensive line and you, and you look for that second corner to play opposite Kyle Fuller, who's, you know, I think 29 coming into this year or will be 29 this season. Uh, um, and instead, they they obviously they, – they tend to operate um, pretty tunnel vision. They have their guys they like to go after, and they also clearly seem to want to address positions that they hold valuable, which – uh, data is not bearing out to have this, you know, agree with them on that. So, yeah, I mean, offense is more important these days, and, and there's you really can't point to an improvement except for maybe Foles. I mean, probably Foles. I think Trubisky's pretty bad. But, um, yeah, I mean, that O-line, they did move on from Harry Highstand, so they're, they're trying to put that one game issue you mentioned on the offensive line coach. He's, but he's held up as one of the better offensive line coaches around the league. So, you know, who knows if they're just trying to scapegoat him or if that's really where the issue came in. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm with you. They are trying to kind of squeeze every last drop out of this core. Um, they have no concern for the long-term vision of the franchise, really. Um, it is just let's get anything possible. Let's try to win every game 10-7 with the 2018 defense again. Um, you know, hopefully Hicks is healthy, Trevathan stays healthy. And then, again, like I said, you know, Jalen Johnson has to kind of step in and be a stud right away. Uh, you know, we don't really know much about Kevin Tolliver. He played a little bit after Mukamara went down. I thought he looked fine, but um, obviously wasn't starting every week. So, yeah, they're, they're really just kind of hoping everything goes their way this year. Um, and if it does, great. If it doesn't, they have a little little cap space next year without Allen Robinson under contract, without a quarterback really under contract, and with Charles Leno and Bobby Massey both kind of in the twilight of their careers. Um so they could be in arguably the worst position in the NFL in 2021, depending on how things play out. Pretty easily could be in that spot. So, so they are at seven and a half on DraftKings. Uh, their win total is seven and a half. I think that's come down. I want to say it that has. Eight, it's eight. eight and a half on Bet Online, and yeah, the under okay. is minus 160. <laughs> so I would say the crazy thing, no one that follows me who's involved with Bears Twitter revenue call would ever say that I'm biased towards the Bears. You, you right. never hear that. You probably hear the opposite. Um, I don't hate like them having a 10 win season. I really don't. Again, my, my concern is long term. Um, I mean, again, in a pre COVID society, who knows what that's going to do to everything. But I, not that I think Foles is a savior, but I think going from, you know, 35th best quarterback in the NFL last year probably to 22nd, 23rd could make a pretty sizable difference. Uh, you mentioned the strength of schedule is not scary. Uh, I think it's one of the easier schedules in the league. Um, and, yeah, and, uh, and the NFC North, in my opinion, had been a strong division for several years, but I see regression from Green Bay for sure. I think they were, what, 9-1 and one in one-score games last year. Um, the Vikings, I love what they did for long term, but I don't see how you replace your number one wide receiver 
all, all of your, your entire secondary, well, just corners, I guess. Yeah, but all your corners and your number one wide receiver and, and have a, you know, pick up where you left off. I don't see that happening. So to yeah, actually I mean, answer, answer your question, I'm, Eric, you want to talk about the Bears? No, I, I think you're absolutely right about the, you know, you look at the, the NFC North is about two, divi- two, two types of teams, right? You have Minnesota and I think Detroit, which may be building long-term well. You know, I, I think their outlook in the future is pretty good. And you have Green Bay and Chicago, who could have good seasons this year, despite being fundamentally weak for the next decade. I, I like that analysis a lot. Um, to actually answer your question, though, George, a couple of win totals that stand out, we can stay in the uh, NFC North. The Please Lions, do, because that's where I wanted to stay. Right. The Lions at six yes. and six. Um, that's our team this year. I really like that over. Um, they were they were cooking offensively in the first half of last year. Um, I don't think their schedule is is particularly daunting. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly need a lot of guys that got hurt last year to stay healthy. But six and a half. I mean, it's not it's not that t- it's not tough to win seven games in the NFL. It it, it really isn't. Yeah. Relatively speaking, and um, six and a half minus one forty is what you're I you're paying say. a decent price. Would you would you go up to seven? At something more like even money, I think I think that might maybe. be the better play. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's it's minus one thirty at DraftKings. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good. Another team that I oh, and I also like the idea, and I think it was uh, Lee Sharp, um, another um, uh, sort of Bears oriented uh, analyst, but still a very very good. Another team. another PFF amigo, by the way. Nice, good, yeah. I, I could tell you could tell uh, from the the breadth of his analysis that, that he. Uh, said he bet the Lions to win the division at like plus 900 yep. earlier in the offseason. That's a hell of a bet. I mean, and, and even if you get it down to seven, 600, I mean, I still think there might be some value there. The team that I like uh, the under on is the Denver Broncos, who seem to be mm. um, sort of a um, sort of like a, a popular favorite, like a pop favorite right yeah. now. Their over under on DraftKings is seven and a half. And it's minus 110 on both sides. Um, so that's, you know, relatively close to even money. And I like the under. They're undergoing heavy transition offensively. They change their, change out their OC. They change out their uh, quarterback's coach. Their uh, starting quarterback has five starts under his belt and is still just a complete mystery. Their numbers two and three receivers have been changed out. Um, and in a year like this where – Again, there are no, there is no rookie minicamp. There is no June minicamp. There are no OTAs. How many preseason games are we going to get? One, maybe. I mean, I would take one at this point. Um, I'd be surprised if we had yeah. one. And I would mention yeah. one other thing with the Broncos under, because I love that that idea of like, oh, this is a trendy, sexy team. Their win total is not that high. But what am I missing here? And you brought up the offensive coordinators. Everyone and their mother loves Drew Locke and assumes that this switching out is going to help him dramatically. Okay, but but how? Like, is he is he quarantining with the new offensive coordinator yeah. and like getting real game reps with this guy? Like, there's a significant chance that that is just completely the wrong way to think about it. And who's the best Bronco that they have had over the past like five years? It, it's Chris Harris Jr. You know, uh, uh, like him, Von Miller, and Chris Harris Jr. No longer there, so their secondary could be bad. I would I would just push back a little on Pat Shermer just because when you look at Eager loves Pat Shermer. Yeah. When you when you look at you know find someone what, you love like Eric <laughs> Eager loves Pat Shermer. Bro. 20, 2017, he obviously was very efficient with Minnesota and Case Keenum. The last two seasons with Eli Manning, they were in the top half of the league in yards per play in twenty eighteen, despite their poor record. Last season, they were 19th, again, despite their poor record. Like, I do think he's undervalued. I agree with you, though, to to that extent. Here's one thing that, you know, I was talking to Ross Tucker about today, which was sort of interesting, and I, and I think it applies to Denver. Teams with a great home field advantage are going to be hurt more by this pandemic than teams without one. Interesting. And Denver – and I know part of Denver's home field advantage is the altitude and things right. like that, which are not going away. But – there, there's obviously knock-on effects for the fact that they are, generally speaking, not a stadium that has that many opposing fans in it, right? Versus some team like Washington, where it's basically 50-50, the Los Angeles Chargers, and then the team that's also in the division with, with the Denver Broncos, which is the Las Vegas Raiders, I think that they're, they were poised to have one of the worst home field advantages in football 
that that you know that poor so you have two teams in that in that AFC West who are going to have poor home field advantage who will now have more like league average home field advantage that hurts Denver I think a little bit just on the margins oh that's a good point that, that's a really good point another one that's similar that feels similar to this uh, Broncos team and is in the same division is the Chargers and if you have no faith in Drew Locke then I, like you probably shouldn't have a whole lot of faith in Justin Herbert and um, a bet online. They're seven and a half. The under is plus plus one fifteen. I think they have a much more talented rest of the roster, but also a really bad offensive line and a rookie quarterback. So that's another one that, that I think fits that bill. They will not suffer the home field advantage uh, loss. It may help them. Um, others that you guys are interested in or want to talk about. Yeah, I'll hop in. I, uh, you know, far be it for me to not join in on knocking Bill O'Brien and having fun with his, his offseason, but Texan seven and a half seems a bit low to me at this point. Um, I, I get they moved on from DeAndre Hopkins, who's arguably the best receiver in the league, but still have a bevy of options. I mean, Cooks is not a slouch. Got to stay healthy, obviously, but him, Stills, Fuller, um, you know, obviously Tunsil's helped get that line to at least average. You know, you hope to see some steps from what Titus Howard and, and, uh, some of the other young guys they have in the offensive line. But I, that division still doesn't entirely scare me. Jags, probably the worst team in the league. Um, and, and we'll see what happens with the Colts, um, with, with Rivers. But I, 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 can see, I see 500 for them, you know, pretty easily still. Yeah, seeing Deshaun Watson have a losing record is like, well, just one of those things you just can't envision. And I would say, man, is there a, a, a um, division – that feels like their strongest teams are the are as weak as as those two are, and maybe that's the wrong way to to phrase it. But like, are you that confident in the Titans or the Colts being a somewhat dominant team? I'm not. According yeah. to opposing win totals at uh, Sharp Football, uh, opposing uh, win total, you know, uh, compilations, you know, not looking back at what the records were last year because who cares about that. But looking ahead to, you know, where the sportsbook win totals are, the Titans and the Colts have the two easiest schedules in the entire NFL. Yep. So, um, I don't know. I like – see, I like the Titans over on eight and a half. And I it's know fine. that this call – hey, you know, Ryan Tannehill is going to regress, regress. Of course he is. He's not going to lead the NFL in yards per attempt and pass rating again. And, you know, but they, they really have consistently limited opponent scoring. Um from, from a defensive standpoint, and then offensively, like they have like a, a nice formula. And if you like the, um, the, the factors that bring along with it, having continuity in, in, in a year where there, isn't, where there were no off-season activities, um, they're bringing back Arthur Smith. And, they, and, and, you know, they're bringing back their quarterback. They're bringing back the centerpiece of their offense, theoretically. They're bringing back four or five offensive line starters. The guy that they lost was significant, Jack Conklin but they replace him with their first round pick. AJ Brown has Ascension written all over him. Johnny Smith contract year, you know, big time athlete, dynamic player. Um, you know, so I, I, I like the over on, on the Titans at, at eight and a half. And, um, uh, you know, again, uh, what, what is projected to be a really soft schedule based on 2020 opponent win, win totals. I, I like know? the, I like the yeah. Titans to win that division too. We have, we have Titans. Yeah. We have Titans Good. with the 29th most difficult schedule the Colts at 27 and then the Texans at 22. You're absolutely right, Evan. The, whether you look at, you know, you fold some in from last year, you just look at power rankings. This is a division full of teams that have it kind of easy. They get the NFC North, which I think we'll see a little bit of a reduction in the strength of Green nice. Bay and, and Minnesota there. I love it. I think we talked about this on your pot, you, know, uh, you and Adam's podcast. We were looking at the Titans. One interesting thing about the Titans is on, on offense, I don't think any of us at you know PFF are enamored with the the run first sort of ideals, right. but we do like the play action. And yes. you know, Tannehill averaged over 13 yards per pass attempt in the regular season with running play action. And then you look at their defense and where they've spent capital. You know, Byers a great player. Uh, you know, Adoree Jackson's a former first round pick. Uh, you know, they they also just got Christian Fulton, who's a first round talent they might not have the best pass rush in the world and that might've hurt them against Kansas city in the playoffs, but they, they are built back to front. And I really do like the way that they limit things uh, defensively. Um, you know, they might not get the most turnovers or sacks in the world, but they're never a sieve. 
uh, the way that some of the TEO, for example, Houston was in their own division a season ago. You're really a back to front guy, aren't you? Um, the, uh, the bills are at nine, Evan, it's, uh, I see it minus minus one fifteen both sides. How many bills over nine wins tickets do you have? All of them? Does anyone else have any? Are you the only person? They're still at eight and a half on DraftKings. What? Even oh, after your bets? Oh, just fire, my. fire the whole barrel, you know, just. You can't move the market that much? Bet, bet, bet the house and the kids. What's so you probably you're more on the Josh Allen MVP side of things. You're getting far better odds there. <laughs> I mean, if they win, if they win 10 games, um, are you confident in, in Josh Allen for MVP? No, I mean, you can't, you can never be confident in, in a guy winning MVP. I like him because he's a long shot. Okay. Stop. To not be a long shot anymore because <sighs> it looks like a lot of sharps mm. are, are hitting that. But, um, you know, just like they were hitting Trubisky last <laughs> year. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, I mean, but 8.5, eight, eight and a half for their over-under at minus 130 on DraftKings looks like – that looks like a really good bet. We're, we're getting up to nine. The, the, the even numbers without the halves, you know, are, it makes it a little bit more difficult. I think I would still bet the over. Um, you want to talk about a team that has continuity, returning their head coach, returning their O.C., Returning Leslie Frazier as their D.C., one of the most underrated defensive coordinators in the league. Um, you know, uh, their, their biggest personnel change really was, Steph, was Stephon Diggs. But what are they doing here? They're pulling out Duke Williams, Isaiah McKenzie, and Robert, uh, Australian for sex, uh, Foster, pulling those guys out <laughs> and using – you have to pull that out, sorry. And, and, and just inserting Stephon Diggs, uh. the damn deep ball receiver in the league, and hopefully that can elevate. I mean, if he goes and gets like you know, like like a little dog, like a doggy chasing a frisbee. If he can just go and get like four or five of those balls that look like they're headed for the stands from Josh. So he's I, not I heard wrong. You, kill, he, that he's will not kill wrong. one or two wins. I heard you talk about this uh, on the podcast with Ian, and I thought it was a really interesting thing because what? So how inaccurate can a quarterback be? Right. where a great receiver can make up for it. it that's, yeah. that's the question that you're asking, right? Because if these, if these throws are 10, 10 feet, 10, you know, 12 feet, 15 feet away from the receiver, Stephon Diggs is a great router and he'd get open. But if the yeah. pass isn't on the money, like what is he going to do? But K Case Keenum's career completion percentage prior to joining the Vikings in 2017 was under 60%. And if you rewatch that season – I mean, basically, and he got caught for it in the playoffs, he got caught for it against Washington, but, like, there was a pretty good, like, basically yeah. one of those guys would run a corner route and Case would just duck and throw it. Like, sure, to but a, a lot of those were contested catches. So, I, you know, it would be yet to be seen. I feel like Josh Allen's inaccuracy is more just like the errant stuff. Let, let me, yeah, let me but, but I think you, that okay? he's going to get a Go completion ahead. percentage edge from having dig so wide open because he's such a good route runner. Okay. The question is, is, Keenum then that year in 2017 for Minnesota completed 68% of his passes, 7.4 yard, yards per attempt. Can Josh Allen do that? Because I think he's going to need to – not to go over nine. I mean, they, they're in a bad division, so there's a – you know, I, I'm not betting that under very very much. But, but, I mean, for them to be like a contender, the way the Vikings were that year, like he does need to just simply elevate his play. And we've already seen him increase his completion percentage like six percentage points in one year, right. you know, that's a, that's a tough ask for him to go against the inertia of, of statistics and, you know, and improve for a second straight year. I, I do think he's not nearly as soft as it appeared Mitch Trubisky to be, you know, everyone thought Mitch Trubisky's running was really going to help. And I would say that it's pretty obvious that was a, a really stupid take. Like he's just not a runner. Whereas Josh Allen is, is a little more well, of actually sure a runner. No better. Yeah, I mean, it could legitimately help him. I, I'm curious about this one. I see that the Chiefs um, plus 115 to take their under at 11 and a half. They just won the Super Bowl. Everyone's super excited about it. Um, there may be a defensive back injury away from once again being an atrocious defensive backfield. Um, any, any, uh, I'm like kind of tempted under 11, 11 and a half is a high number plus price. Anyone. It's high. It is, right? 
Yeah, they were 10 and a half last year, if I recall correctly. Maybe some 11s hanging around there. You're certainly paying a premium for their Super Bowl. Um, you know, I think that I don't know if you agree with this, but you know, yeah, especially Brad, you 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 know, you're talking about recently, like how might, a lot of veterans might get cut during August if there's a, you know, a, an indication that the the salary cap's going to go down uh, next season for 2021. Like I think I. I think any all of these extremes, you just play the other side. You know, Washington over five, you know, Chiefs and 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 uh, Ravens under eleven and a half. Like I think everything gets smushed towards eight. Yeah, just just to circle back to the um, to Josh Allen because I, mean, I don't know why we're talking about anything else, but just the the it's really not even about Josh Allen. It's about how much can the supporting cast elevate a quarterback that we know has certain deficiencies. And Eric brought up, brought up a great example in Case Keenum. We can go back to Matt Castle with Randy Moss. Go look at the splits of Tom Brady's production with and without Rob Gronkowski. Um, and another good example was Andy Dalton in 2015 when he had freaking A.J. Green, Marvin Jones, Muhammad Sanu, Tyler Eifert played 13 games that year. Um, you know, they had a good offensive line in, in, in Gio Bernard. Their offensive line was dope. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that there's enough evidence there that a supporting cast really can elevate the play of a quarter or the production and the efficiency of a quarterback. So, I don't know. It's going to be a fun I, year. I, man. See, I a am. Fun year watching Josh Allen and all the haters. This is a really long year, especially. Oh, it, it's. And- your, your point is tremendous. And what I, would po- what I would point out there is the quarterbacks that you mentioned, maybe with the exception of Keenum, who I do kind of feel like, like if you look at the places he was before then, they were awful situations. So, you know, it, what, he had Andre I, Johnson in Houston and DeAndre yeah, Hopkins. In but he was, getting, he was getting pelted by right. oncoming defenders at will. So, you know, and it, anyways, was his coach. The, the one thing that I think is really interesting here is you mentioned Tom Brady. Okay, Tom Brady's super accurate. You mentioned Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton's super accurate. He can't play when the lights are on, but, like, he's accurate. The question here is where, can your, where does your accuracy need to be? How bad can your accuracy be where the supporting cast can actually help you? Is it really something where if you're sitting there and you're like, I'm just so confident this guy's going to be open and I know where he's going to be, and all of a sudden I'm throwing with confidence and now I'm accurate? You know, I, it, I think it's a fascinating question. I'm, I'm really excited. I just really hope they play games. <laughs> That's a great point. Um, all right, let's get out of here on this. Uh, anyone have a last, um, a last win total? that they, they're excited about. I have one if no one else does. I can Go ahead, Brad. jump in as well with one that I'm sure you'll love, George. Uh, you know, just speaking of fading Super Bowl participants in the following year. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the 49ers under is definitely appealing to me. Um, ten and a half, right? Say, it's ten and a half, correct. Um, I mean, there's obviously the classic, you know, loser the Super Bowl regression, all of that. But I think there's more at play. Um, Obviously, Debo Samuel out for a stretch. We don't know how long right now, but that'll have a pretty big impact. And, and you know, Manny Sanders, if I'm, I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, was there for the first half of the year and then obviously went to – or excuse me, they're the whole year, what I'm saying. So he's now on the Saints as well. So, yeah, I think that's a decent – Second runner. half of the year. Second half of the year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I like that bet. I mean, you just have to look at San Francisco's schedule. They have to basically start the year 5-1 and one or 4-2 and two for this to have a chance to go over because it's it just like a season ago. It's easy early – and really tough later on. Um, and, you know, if they're missing out on too many guys early in the season when there are games to be won, it might be tough for them. Mm-hmm. Eric, you got one? Yeah, I mean, we talked about this last week, and uh, I talked about this with, with Ross, you know, Tucker today on his show. I, I like a Washington over five, um, if you can get that. I mean, look, Ron Rivera is a good coach. I know Jack Del Rio says some weird things on Twitter, but he's a good defensive coordinator. Um, when you look at that defensive line, you have Vontez Sweat, Chase Young, uh, Matt Idenitis, um, you know, uh, who's the guy, Deron Payne, and then they had the other guy, Jonathan Allen from L. Like, they're a monster group up front. And then they went and got Kendall Fuller, who's a you know, pretty versatile defensive back to go with Landon Collins on the back end. Dwayne Haskins was a top 10 graded quarterback a season ago from weeks 11 to 16. So, you know, not to say that that, you know, he's the best, you know, 10th best quarterback in the league. 
he certainly has it in him to string some games together. And that's really all you need for a team to go over five. Evan? No, nah, man, I already fired off all my takes. But uh, I did want to say one thing, though. Um, Chris Wessling, uh, great yes. football analyst for many, many years. I worked back-to-back -back with him at Roto World for many, many years. Back in uh, 2011, I think it was, yeah, 2011 when the, um, the, the lockout uh, occurred and, like, all the NFL transaction news was just dead until, I can't even remember, like, July. And usually, you know, it's just, it's just a steady stream. Well, then it was about seven days because it just all got backed up and it just all happened in one chunk, like in one week. Mm -hmm. And we would do like wrestling, um, working, you know, he would work like 11 hours. I'd go try to, you know, catch four hours of Z's. And, you know, then I would come on and, uh, at, at Roto World and we were, and we, we were able to somehow keep up, keep pay. And I would, I had to work some time at pro football talk. And I think he did too, even we didn't, Greg Rosenthal was our, technically our boss at the time. He was doing everything uh, on PFT and they were trying to keep up with all the news. So I feel like a real, real strong connection with him and um, just one of the best writers uh, that there is. He was recently, he, he beat cancer a couple of years ago and he was recently re-diagnosed that um, he, the cancer came back. Um, the doctors do seem relatively optimistic because they caught it a lot earlier this time than they did uh, the first time. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Chris Wessling, like just thinking of him um, all the time. And uh, he was actually the first guy I remember, I don't even, it must have been your guys for, it was certainly your guys first year, uh, PFF's first year. And he was like, yo, check out this website, Pro Football Focus. <laughs> it's awesome. You know, and he's actually had his quarrels with PFF over the years, but I can tell you that he's the first person that ever introduced me and Greg Rosenthal to uh, PFF. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, he's a, he's a believer in your guys, in, in you guys. And like, you know, we, we should all be a believer in him because uh, he's, he's a legit, great, great person. Um, he's like an old soul. And um, he's someone that like we could learn a lot from if you if you read his articles and you listen to him on on his, on his podcast and just just thinking of him. That was well said. I think there's a lot of people out there battling things that we can learn a lot from. That is for sure. Um, so shout out to all of you guys that are battling it. Uh, we appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys hanging out with uh, Eric and I. This was a lot of fun. We'll do it again soon. Uh, be well. Stay safe. See you guys later.